Eh, vi ringrazio moltissimo di essere venuti qui in istituto oggi, eh, sono eh, veramente molto felice che ci sia così tanto pubblico eh, a questa presentazione della mostra eh, di Giovanni Foncuberta. Eh, non so da dove cominciare perché ho detto tante cose con tanti colleghi e amici fino adesso che sono abbastanza confuso, quindi cercherò di essere molto breve ringraziando prima di tutto eh, Joan, perché questa cosa era nata quasi per scherzo e invece eh, lui ha reagito con una tale generosità che eh, è venuto eh, in istituto molte volte, abbiamo passato molti giorni insieme, ha lavorato con grande felicità qui in istituto e devo dire che eh, è stato veramente un, un processo eh, proficuo che all'inizio ci ha un po' spaventato perché un istituto che tira fuori oggetti traumatizzati eh, non è così semplice però ehm, il percorso è stato così interessante e così intenso che sono veramente contento e lo ringrazio molto di essere stato qui con noi e di aver accettato il nostro invito eh, ringrazio Francesca Fabiani che è sul palco in questo momento e eh, che eh, tra un po' ci saluterà e mi sembra l'occasione buona per eh, ringraziare tutti i colleghi dell'istituto perché in questi anni abbiamo fatto un lavoro molto importante, molto, molto intenso devo dire siamo sempre meno, però non molliamo e quindi eh, mi sembra l'occasione per eh, ringraziare i colleghi della fotografia contemporanea, ma anche i colleghi del, del, del servizio di catalogazione, queste sono le due grandi anime della nostra struttura. Eh, la collezione di contemporaneo in questo momento sta crescendo con ritmi esponenziali, eh, le opere di Joan faranno parte della nostra collezione, che in questi ultimi quattro anni è cresciuta di circa 800 pezzi. E sono molto contento perché in questo momento rappresenta eh, gran parte della fotografia italiana e cominciamo anche a, a contaminarci con i eh, contributi europei. Eh, il catalogo sta crescendo, quindi devo dire che sono molto felice, sono molto felice di condividere con voi stasera questa mia eh, felicità. Eh, passo la parola eh, a Francesca Fabiani, eh, le porto il microfono e ci dirà due parole sulla cura della direzione. Grazie, benvenuti a tutti e anche io mi associo al direttore, sono molto felice anche perché è stato un percorso lento, abbiamo coinvolto John prima della pandemia e già dal primo approccio, senza nemmeno sentire le condizioni, ho incontrato John alla Galleria del Cembalo e senza nemmeno sentire le condizioni mi ha detto sì, è sporro la militanza, mi ha accettato questa residenza d'artista che è un programma che va avanti da qualche anno e che, come si capisce dal titolo, prevede la presenza di un fotografo contemporaneo in dialogo con le nostre collezioni. Come già anticipato il direttore, appunto, la prima richiesta di John di lavorare sul materiale deteriorato ci ha messo un po' in imbarazzo, soprattutto qui la conservatrice è saltata sulla sedia perché il primo istinto è stato quello di dire non abbiamo nulla di rovinato qua, noi conserviamo tutto benissimo. Per un'istituzione come la nostra che dal 1895 acquisisce e conserva fotografia, insomma tirare fuori gli schermi più all'armadio è stato un po' una sfida che abbiamo accolto volentieri e Joan vi racconterà come si è sviluppato il progetto, l'esito lo vedremo insieme alla fine in questa mostra bellissima. Eh, quindi io non spoilererò altro, voglio solo veramente anch'io ringraziare ovviamente Joan prima di tutto, il nostro direttore che ci lascia giocare in libertà e ci fa molto divertire, tutto il team di fotografia storica e contemporanea, Sita Tecchi, Alessandro Poco, Stefano Valentini e eh, Simona Turco e una nuova acquisizione di Diego Bericat che ha seguito in particolare l'allestimento e tre angeli proprio più che custodi eh, a cui dobbiamo tutta quest'ultima fase che come avete visto mi ha visto invalida quindi senza di loro non sarebbe stato possibile Mario Radis, Giulia Vincenzi e Giulia De Gregori tutti e le disegnate già con cuberta, cultura di polvere
Permettetemi di fare un ringraziamento ai colleghi della Direzione Generale per l'attività contemporanea perché anche grazie ad un finanziamento che noi possiamo eh, presentare e realizzare questi progetti. Loro credono spesso in noi, noi siamo molto felici e cerchiamo di essere all'altezza eh, della loro fiducia. Grazie e ecco. Buonasera, eh, mi dispiace, io non parlo italiano, capito, ma non parlo. Allora um, vado a parlare in inglese. Um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I would even say that for me this is an orgasmic moment. Why? Because uh, we've been working for about four years. Uh, when uh, Francesca invited me to work in the archive here, I immediately thought, well, she's not very prudent. She, she doesn't know <laughs> what, what the, the, the threatens that she's going to face. And uh, this has been a very long process because of the pandemic. And just opening this exhibition and publishing this book, I'm absolutely thrilled. So uh, it's me who would acknowledge Ichichiri, Carlo, the team, Francesca, for letting me the opportunity to have been working with such a wonderful material and be able to respond with uh, the project I've done. As Francesca said, uh, I will try to provide the context on both the exhibition and the book. But uh, I don't like to do a scholar presentation. I just want to talk about my experience. And I will start with uh, my experience right now. I mean, last, last night. I was invited to have dinner with some friends. And from my hotel to the place where the dinner was going to take the place, uh, I found two elements that I want to share with you because they are quite fun. First, that. I was walking on the street and thought, Banca del Tempo, wow, that's wonderful. You don't invest money and get profit, you get, maybe you invest hours and get weeks or years. So, for a photographer who is always fighting about time and past, uh, I thought that it was a, a good, good beginning. Huh? Maybe photography is also a bank of time. The second funny thing I found, and it's really sometimes chance is beautiful. Huh? This was that, that advertising. I thought, wow. <laughs> so death is just holidays. I mean, uh, when, when you go to the cemetery, finally it's like going to a resort when you will enjoy of the eternal rest in peace. And again, I thought that photography was connected to somehow death. Photography is a protection against death. Uh, photography promised that we will be eternal. Maybe our body will disappear, but our image will rest forever. That was our illusion. And I think that this exhibition is proving that unfortunately that's not the case. Even photographs disappear. Well, uh, let me go to the beginning. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to articulate my talk on an uh, Italian thinker, I, I choose that especially being in Rome, Antonio Gramsci. And this sentence is quite uh, inspiring for me. Il vecchio mondo sta morendo, quello nuovo tarda a comparire e in questo chiaro scuro nascono i monstri. I like this idea of monsters. Uh, of course, Gramsci was dealing with the political situation in the 20s when he was in prison. Uh, the old world was the bourgeois democracies and the new world was the revolutionary horizon which was in the distance and in between there were the totalitarian fascism and so on. So uh, we can transfer this idea to visual culture. The old visual culture is dying. We are facing a new visual culture and in between there are some monsters, some goats. I'm interested in finding those ghosts. I like this um, quotation 
first of all, because it's fake. Gramsci never wrote that. It was a, 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 a bad translation, or not a bad translation. A translation thinking more in advertising and having an elegant statement than the original sentence. And this translation was done by someone very intelligent, Amos Chisek. That's the original quotation. It's not exactly the same, but somehow there are no monsters here, but the phenomena monopoly. Okay. Let's talk about phenomena monopoly. Okay. My work has been obsessed by one uh, game of words. I say that I am interested in the photography of nature to find out how is the nature of photography. And because of that, I think that photography has three main axes. Uh, when it was born, uh, it was embedded with some values, which was memory, truth, and matter. Photography is an object, you can touch it. Photography is a proof, it's an evidence, it's a vital inscription of reality. And photography is a, a, a safe uh, deposit of our experiences. It's to keep our memories. Okay. So I've been dealing with the three conceptual answers. Let's start with uh, truth. My work has been showing how all photographs are illusions, are uh, human constructions, interpretations, that there's no truth inherent in photography. So I invented plants that don't exist, but I photographed them. And I faced the viewer with the necessity to unveil that tension which is always underlying the photograph. This looks like a flower, but it's just a piece of garbage, of burnt plastic that I found traveling around actually in Barcelona. And of course, I did that, you know, with an art model of my, my, my mind, lost of that the new objectivity was the same. So I was creating with the assistance of the camera, nature which doesn't exist, flowers, animals, or I was presenting myself as a Soviet cosmonaut, I was creating fictional narratives, uh, and, and always I was proving that the camera was a tool for imagination, that the camera was not tied to reality, to facts, as we see them. So uh, I was building this kind of uh, fictional narratives. And uh, digital culture show up, emerge, and change everything. So I've been also transferring this kind of narratives to other aspects. Let me just project a very short one to give you a taste of an example. This is a short project called Holy Innocence. When email started to be very common and familiar, it was around 1990 always, immediately we were pissed off with spam. We were receiving unwanted messages. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I like to collect this kind of material. And among them, I, my favorite word, scam. Scam is the kind of email which tries to fool you, to trick you, in order to get money, to steal money from you somehow, for instance. You receive uh, mails uh, from, uh, I don't know, uh, Ukrainian, Russian girls uh, pretending that uh, your profile uh, is very nasty for them, established from French, and at a certain point they ask you, I would like to visit them. Come, come and visit. Yes, but I have no money to pay my plane ticket, so could you advance me some money? I will return for my, my apartment. And if you send money, friends you and so on. So uh, I've been collecting this kind of uh, portraits of girls trying to be my friends. And I've done project on it. But uh, I want to concentrate on another one that was very funny. It's another style. They are called Nigerian letters. And the uh, system is always the same. Uh, someone pretends to be, for instance, the, the son 
of uh, military or the prime minister of uh, Ivory Coast of Nigeria and there has been a revolution and uh, his father was killed, was murdered, but they had the millions in a Swiss bank and they want you to help to do correct investments for those monies. Okay? So, I, I, I was in a, an art residency in a small village in Spain, and uh, they invite, uh, it belongs to a foundation, they invite uh, writers and artists to stay there for a few weeks and produce a, a publication. So I was there and I had, was looking for inspiration. Suddenly, a mail Someone called Captain Cook. From Peter Pan, no, no, Captain Hook from the US Army in Iraq, uh, in the moment of the Iraq war. And this guy pretended that he was the leader of a patrol that tries to get in the Saddam Hussein palace, and they found you know, a container full of cash in different currencies, uh, dollars and euros, and, but men, and, and uh, of course, the same. Uh, I was someone honest to help them to invest that money in uh, you know, with enterprises which were for good. And he was providing even you know, a clipping from the BBC. And this actually happened. So, uh, of course, the military authorities sized most of the money, but so much the price took some for, for themselves. I said, well, then it looks credible, but uh, you know, I'm some, somehow expert in, in fiction and things and life, so I, I don't trust photographs. Could you send me a, a better photograph uh, to uh, prove uh, the, the money that you got in the Saddam Hussein Palace? Oh, and send me this picture. Oh, oh, that's quite, quite impressive. Quite impressive. Yes, yes, I, I want to collaborate and, and help you to, to invest the money. But you know, I've seen some films, and the gangsters usually cut some newspapers and do some false uh, amount of money. I mean, that maybe only the, the top of, of it's true. So give me a close up. Okay, is that yes, it's a, uh, One is not enough, give me more, said the robot. Now, now I believe you. Okay, that's right. Certainly I will have. Let me introduce you myself. I'm the priest of a church in Barcelona called Sagrada Familia. And it was designed by a well-known uh, architect called Gaudí. And uh, it's not finished because uh, there's no money. It's very expensive. So your money from Saddam Hussein will be implemented the construction and God will thank for that. I said, but now I introduce myself. I introduce myself. And he said, I need to put his passport. Well, then I, I, I immediately uh, understood that the book was done, the project was done. I was going to exchange emails with this guy. The book was going to have 128 pages. So if I could send 60 messages and received 60 answers was all that. So I was keeping. Okay, <coughs> and I know what it is. The longest story is published, you can get it. But the thing is that he finally told me that the money was in a safe in, in, in uh, Vietnam. Well, no problem. I take a plane ticket and go to Vietnam to get for the money. So it, it was really a, a long story. But just uh, when I finished the, the 60 messages, uh, I said, well, uh, I should now cut with the correspondence. So I said, oh, I'm sorry, but the, 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 the Bishop of Barcelona uh, has noticed about our correspondence, and I think that the Vatican is not allowing these transactions, and probably uh, you will get some uh, news from the Vatican you know, officers to go out with this uh, money. For the church. So, uh, this is the book. This is the book, uh, and uh, I, I, I did a kind of a device. It, it was printed in two colors, and the uh, reader was given to 
who tell in filters what in print, what in red. So according to the filter uh, you were using, you get one version or the other. So it was a wonderful demonstration that the truth is always according to the filter to judge reality. This was the place where I was <laughs> staying, which was uh, you know, uh, uh, walls from medieval times. You know, this is the book. Right. Okay. Let's jump in. It was about, about truth. Let's talk about money. Photography as an art. Maybe the history of photography is an evolution from a thick material that the girl had to pass a piece of metal to intangible images. So photography has lost its body. The soul remains, but the body is gone. So I'm very interested in recording body to photography. And because of that, I'm working with uh, photosherapy. This is a very old 19th century Russian group in which the uh, ceramic pigment uh, in a high temperature will last not forever, but very long. That's the reason photoceramic is a technique used in cemeteries for the portraits of the dead. So, uh, with this kind of technique, I've been doing murals in public areas in different cities. This was in Barcelona. This is composed, composed of uh, uh, 8,000 photographs provided by Barcelona citizens responding to my request of uh, interpreting, illustrating the idea of freedom. And uh, there were photographs of all kinds. And with that, I compose this uh, mural, this photo mosaic, which is called, of course, the Kings. And I jump to another one which I've done in Italy, in Familia, which was just inaugurated open last year. It's the facade of the Museum Civici, and it's a, an old uh, museum holding collections of uh, natural science, art, um, craft, history, and many other things. So I photographed uh, Peacock, Avone, from their collection, and uh, Avone, Peacock, is the symbol for beauty and curiosity. So it was perfect for art and science. And again, I asked uh, people in Reggio Emilia to send photographs of the idea of curiosity, especially visiting the museum. So we received 12,000 photographs that I mixed was woven with the photographs of the museum inventory of the full collection. So thousands of photographs of the different pieces. It was printed at the um, that's the, the Ceramic Corporation in Italy, Marazzi, Marazzi, sorry. So this is the Marazzi production, uh, the, the production of the, of the piece. And again, this is a permanent, permanent uh, mural. Again, about uh, the materiality. Uh, I live in the countryside, in a very humid area. And uh, when I'm traveling, uh, I have my, my post box outside on the street. And if I'm traveling and I can pick up my letters that the postman delivers, the snails arrive in the paper. At the beginning, I was a little pissed off. That's happening. But then I understood that the snails were going to work for me. Because uh, I like the way the snakes hit the paper, especially that the paper are invitation cards from museums and galleries uh, announcing uh, an exhibition. This means reproducing an art. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. Snakes eat art. <laughs> that they are feeding themselves with Picasso, with Goya, with uh, Michelangelo. So I let them go on. Okay, eat, eat. Just go ahead. And at a certain moment, I just stop the process and scan the results for reproduce and did some large amount. So what was just garbage 
as we come in and after the piece. Let's show you some examples. These, for instance, are the results of the snails. And to me, that was interesting uh, in the means that uh, uh, they prove the materiality of the photograph. I mean, if you want to eat a photograph, you need something consistent. You cannot eat a digital photo. You must have some quality. Okay? That was the usual display uh, in a museum. Uh, there's a camera with uh, imitation cars printed by the museum for their exhibitions and two dozens of wild snails eating during the exhibition those imitation cars. From time to time I was going there and making one of the exhibitions, enlarging it, hanging on the wall. So the, the same image was in a kind of detritus, as a, as a, you know, a remains of the action for us the snail, and at the other it was a, an artwork with all the resemblance and I think the caption frame and so on. So this is the action of the snails, which is also we could consider advertising for slow food. <laughs> so I don't like fast food, so you have slow food. And uh, this is the beginning of an idea about uh, authorship. Uh, maybe uh, here I should uh, split my copyright of those uh, works with the snails, because actually they are doing the work. I just uh, select final review and provide many. But actually, the, the workers are the snails. Well, the funny thing in this kind of performance is that at the end of the exhibition, I invited my friends and the museum officers and we ate the snails, <laughs> which ate the car. So the, the cycle gets it's closed. Uh, trauma. Trauma is uh, the umbrella holding the exhibition here at the CC. Uh, this comes from the finding of materials in a very poor state. For instance, uh, these are 35 millimeters film in the National Archive of Catalonia, and believe it or not, these are these were photographs, documents of the Spanish Civil War. Fortunately, they are absolutely lost, gone. Well, I've been interested in this kind of situation for many reasons, just some nostalgia, of course. But uh, somehow, these are the last remains of the photographs as objects. This is what is lasting. And then we are going to jump to these unmaterial images, algorithmic or digital. I mean, this <coughs> photography without the body. So when traveling, I try to visit archives, collections, looking for those situations. For instance, this was in Cuba, the Autoteca Nacional. These were portraits of uh, important politicians, prime ministers in the past, or presidents of the republic. And this is just the ghost, just the shadow. Only you know, the, the remains of the chemical process. And when the photograph is losing the link with the reality, and only those chemical remains last, uh, Photographs becomes like a ghost. In uh, Oriental traditions, a ghost is a soul of a dead person, unable to rest forever because one task has been not accomplished. This means maybe the task was documenting or providing information about the person or the landscape or the path of whatever the photograph was uh, representing. Well, so, <coughs> I've been visiting many archives, for instance in Mexico, I spent one month in different cities uh, looking for photographs of the revolution, the Mexican revolution. Then I went to this idea of trauma. Most of uh, important photography, photojournalism, and documentary photography deal with uh, trauma in humanity, wars, suffering, uh, accidents, uh, blood. And so on. But at the same time, photography 
pues su Dios y que hizo un trauma. Those photographs are in a traumatic situation because they are suffering, they are killed, they are sentenced to death. Probably, in, I go back to the same archive and try to photograph the same negative, uh, it will be much more damaged. So somehow, my uh, shooting is encapsulating a specific moment, a snapshot of the life of this image. And then I realized that uh, this situation was also a palimpsest. There was a landscape, for instance, and another landscape. The landscape taken by the photograph, walked by the photographer, and another one created by the microorganism. That is, uh, I never filter or uh, do manipulations in the color. Uh, I am interested in respecting the object as it is found. Uh, I, I work in the discipline of uh, object uh, tradition. Uh, I like to find the object, recognize its value, and just change the context. So this is the effect of the bacteria, of the fungi, mold, humidity, and so on. And this is also related to infection. When doing this work, I mentioned that the pandemic was the COVID, and uh, we are well, uh, we are suffering with this kind of uh, virus attack. And here, it's a metaphor of uh, this uh, COVID situation. It's not the same virus but somehow the effect is the same. Then uh, I've been doing different kind of works or sections, for instance, one is called Kintsugi, which is dealing with the scars, with the bones of the photographic material. Kintsugi is a Japanese technique. When a ceramic base is broken, they don't throw it away, but instead they recompose the pieces, and they don't try to hide uh, the fracture. Instead, they outline it with golden thread. And they believe that uh, the final piece has a more profound value than a new one because this is uh, providing all the life and experience, all the energy of the user of this object. So I did the book with that and again. Well, then we arrived in the Photographic Nazionale. I should tell that uh, for me it was difficult to find a line because uh, there were thousands of possibilities. Actually, I was using many different materials and was really inspired. And uh, probably I will do other projects with the material that uh, I found here. But uh, <coughs> the collection of Francesco uh, Kiji uh, was uh, especially interesting because uh, it, it was very compelling. It was uh, you know, an aristocratic uh, person interested in photography as an amateur, interested in, in landscape. So he did a lot of photographs of the Alps, the mountains, and uh, I thought that this kind of landscapes uh, displaying this uh, unexpected sidereal or galactic uh, form was very interesting. So uh, I, I decided to uh, work specifically with uh, this uh, Kiji uh, archive. And I think that the, the fragments uh, I shoot were uh, especially uh, really aesthetically very, very shocking and interesting, and also very poetic kind of uh, atmosphere. And then, having this, uh, I, I came several times, so I got familiar. Uh, I, I finally, I, get, I got along well with those places. I, I, I was friends with them. We established a close relationship, so I was having them in my hands, and I was looking at them as an object in different polyadric positions. And then, when I was looking at one of these negative plates, I realized that if you turn that negative, it was not a negative, it was a transparent, a stereoscopic uh, transparency to be projected. 
And then when you were not looking at the transparency through the light, but looking at the surface of the emotion, uh, it was looking like the Le Vache de Poussière, the famous uh, iconic artwork by Marcel Duchamp, who was photographed by Henry in 1920. And it was you know, a very uh, canonic piece. Uh, Man, Man Ray and Duchamp just used a large plate of glass and let the dust deposit creating this kind of uh, mysterious landscape. Okay. So it was the action of time, the action of randomness, the action of matter. And you know that uh, this piece was called uh, Le Grand Père, the big glass. And having the transparencies from each in my hands, I thought that that was the sham, the grand bear, but this was the small bear. But it was the bear, it was the same thing. It was, uh, and and, and I, I decided to work uh, as a, another direction on this, looking for this dust landscape. So I was doing close ups of this emotion with a uh, very, uh, you know, uh, slow light, very powerful, uh, outlining the, the, the texture of the dust. And I was creating this kind of sideral views. And at this point, another idea came to my mind. Uh, last year, there was a, a TV series released, starred by Nicole Kidman. It's, it's called Roar. And it's the story of a woman who eats photographs. I mean, physically eats photographs. Let me show you. Around. The story of a woman, her mother is suffering Alzheimer, so she's going to pick her up and bring her home, and uh, she's, uh, you know, closing the closets and found the family album. And then, looking at the family album, she's having that reaction. So, what would this remind to you? It's like Marcel Proust's motherland. I mean, you have a motherland in the tea, you eat the motherland, and then oh, they remember my past, forgotten. It's exactly the same, but in, in, you know, in contemporary life. So, I love this idea of eating photographs. And then I realized that uh, this is not something new that in history. Uh, there's been rituals involving eating images. For instance, in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, you had the Santini Eboli in Milan after uh, the 16th century. So people could eat uh, prints depicting the image of a sand, and they believed that the, the properties or the qualities of the sand were going to be transferred. And there are many examples of the ancient. Uh, Egyptian Empire, the Bible, I mean, the, the, the ritual, the gesture of eating photographs. So I said, okay, let's let's uh, transfer this to uh, the photographic situation and the in DGD. Again, we have a uh, dust landscape. So let's try to find out which kind of agent is eating those photographs. So, okay, we. Uh, look for the assistance of biologists of the 
University of Rome and then the University of Barcelona. We went to the uh, Department of uh, Biology, the section of uh, uh, electronic microscopy, and we were analyzing which kind of microorganism were emitting images, which could be said in other words, which kind of organism are eating memory. And these are they. I introduce you the memory meters uh, Aspergillus, Actinomycetes, Acremonium, Cladosporium, the Artemisium. <laughs> they look like uh, uh, alchemia, uh, alchemist uh, agents. Okay? So this is the portrait of one of them. And this is another portrait. And another portrait. And with them, uh, in the book we had published on the occasion of the exhibition, I displayed as a diptych at one hand a detail of the dust landscape, which is the microscopic view, and at the other, the corresponding microscopic, uh, the microscopic and the microscopic view. It's a kind of diptych photography. He died in 1980. And his posthumous book, The Shamrecler, has been a kind of Bible for all of the photography lovers. And my, my question is, what part would have thought of digital photography and artificial intelligence? That is a project that the archive I used was the photographs uh, published in a Mexican newspaper with crime and bloody uh, you know, things and so on. <clears throat> this, this magazine, this newspaper, shut down and all the archive went to the flea market. And uh, a friend of mine bought it and I, I was able to use it. And then it was about uh, 60,000 photographs, police photographs, photographs of farmers, of mafia, crimes, really very important. And I realized that in many of the images, there was someone pointing with a finger, which was what Mark said. Photograph is an index. It's an index as a semiotic category, but also an index as one of our fingers in the hand we use to create a kind of a gesture cover. And it was very fun. It was very interesting, for instance. This is a, a girl pointing the place where her father ran. This is a girl pointing the guy who uh, beat him. This is a, probably a, a medicine doctor showing uh, the body of the woman. And, so, and of course, these are one hand documents, but at the other, you realize that they are very theatrical, so they are staged. It's a mise en scène. I mean, it's not normal that you do like that. Uh, in, uh, the photographer asks, okay, point the, 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 the valent hole, or point uh, your aggressor, or point the, the place where the, like that. So somehow it's a contradiction between society, in what was in front of the camera, or the, 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 the evidence that uh, uh, this situation was artificially. Uh, posed by, by, the, by the photographer. And with all those pictures, I've done a video in which I have articulated the images in the way that they create as the, the, the hands of the plot. They, they change the orientation and they are pointing different hours. So again, it's about time, time passes. that little by little the position of the finger is changing doing all the circles of the clock.
And uh, we have these two books that we are going to present in the Torino uh, book fair in two weeks. The Contra Artes and the Cultura di Conte. Now, I go to the other side. Uh, I've been showing the remains of this uh, uh, photography as object and jump to uh, photography without substance, photography without matter, photography uh, created, for instance, by algorithms. I'm doing now uh, a series of trees, but the uh, interesting point is that those trees don't exist. They have been done, they've been generated with a software that is called uh, Stable Diffusion. And you just provide, just provide a prompt, this is a description, I want the tree in a park, in that place, and the software is uh, creating thousands of different versions. And of course, this is completely changing our sense of truth, memory, so we are in a revolutionary moment, as important as in 1839 when photography was born. And people at that time didn't understand the daguerreotype. It was like a mirror which encapsulated the reflections. They didn't understand what was happening, but they should believe because they had the daguerreotype in the hand. We don't understand how this miracle is possible, but we should believe it because I'm projecting those images on the screen. So there are many different uh, tools. I've been using another one, which is the, the GIN algorithm. It's a generative adversarial network. And in this case, uh, I'm, I'm using collections of museums or archives to produce images which replicate the originals, but it's not exactly the same. It's that they get the style, but in the process, they produce uh, accidents, and those accidents are uh, so interesting from the creative point of view that uh, really fascinating. For instance, uh, I've been uh, accessing important museums like Museo del Prado in Madrid, uh, Museum of National Art in Barcelona. I'm trying to get the collection of the Louvre and so on. So uh, I got thousands of uh, images, the inventory of the full collection, and uh, it was digested by the algorithm which was providing this kind of uh, shapes, this kind of forms, in which we still recognize the style of several masters in painting, but uh, uh, these are just uh, errors, just uh, things that uh, are not correct. Let me show you now. Let me finish with uh, this project uh, accomplished with the same technology, with this uh, generative adversarial networks algorithm, uh, with uh, this particular series, Beautiful Black. In this case, uh, I found uh, a web page in the internet. I worked that with a colleague, uh, Mila Rosado, who is an artist, and we worked together in this uh, artificial intelligence series. And this particular web page, um, is presenting thousands of video selfies of people in the moment of experience and orgasm. There are men, women, uh, old people, young people, and the only condition to participate and, and upload your orgasm is that you should click and uh, you know, ensure that the orgasm is authentic, it's not fake. Okay? So there are thousands of people. 
تطلع في مكان ناو كت جوجل يديكو غايون يدي كان اكسس ديس ويب بيج شوف ذيس از ذا سيريز ا راندوم سيريز اوف اكشوال اورجازم photographs that uh, I, I download from this, uh, from this uh, page. And uh, that algorithm is reading, is scanning all those thousands of images and in a random way try to provide images which little by little, by a trial and error process, a kind of a deep learning system, is going to uh, imitate not the original images, but the uh, regularities, the, the patterns which configure the original images. For instance, it's starting by colors, uh, textures, shapes, structures, and in a kind of you know, uh, sequence, every time we improve the result, uh, each image is 1024 by 1024 pixels. This means 1 million of uh, probabilities, combinations. But one, every pixel is 1 million of different colors as possibility. So it's 1 million for 1 million of repertory of possible combinations. So you should work with a supercomputer. It's not something you can do with a domestic computer. So you should access a very powerful server like what we've been using that the most powerful computer in Spain is called Mare Nostrum, as, as a name, and it's owned by the University of Barcelona. So, uh, that the process is about one month of uh, computing without stop, 24 hours, 24 hours, and each column is maybe one day of uh, progress. And little by little, the system is getting the style of the initial images and we are improving and improving and improving and finally we arrive to images, to portraits of non-existing people having the orders that we could, you know, change uh, by the original ones and even an expert guy would have some problems to make the point of the difference. Okay, but I'm not interested in perfection. Probably advertising, fashion, and the industrial world are interested in those, those uh, final results. I'm interested in the imperfection, in the accident, in the process. But in that case, uh, I realized that uh, with this process, we found out which are the trends which characterize the expression of orgasm which is, for instance, a specific expression in the mouth, in the eyes, and so on. So we said, okay, let's, let's go on and let's expand our experience and apply with the technology of deep fake. So we had an idea. We were going to look for uh, public individuals, politicians, who had been involved in sexual scandals, uh, right? Uh, sexual harassment, adultery, and so on. And we were going to buy uh, 30 segments of inter public interventions, for instance, uh, political meetings, press conference, and so on. And in the middle of, of the speech, the person would stop, experience the orgasm, and then go on with the speech. Let me show what he wants. No, I didn't. I didn't ask him to withdraw, but he walked in this morning. He said it's going to be a rough time for him.
Comment ne pas voir Comment les Français ne verraient-ils pas dans ce carré de fait Caballero del Peugeot de l'Ordre. Per risolvere il problema completamente non c'è This was accomplished during an art residency in a center in France called Le Prenois uh, in Lille, which specialized in um, art and, and uh, advanced technologies. Uh, it belongs, it depends on the Ministry of Culture. So in order to do this project, there was a big issue dealing with uh, legal concerns. I mean, that uh, technologically was having some difficulties, but that was not the problem. So we spent more time uh, discussing with lawyers than discussing with the uh, you know, uh, uh, assistants, uh, the technicians who would help us to do the project. And we were finally given a green light to go ahead with three conditions. First, we shouldn't uh, apply this kind of deep fake technology on a singular uh, individual. It should be a category. Said the okay, no problem. Category will be uh, public individuals uh, who had some uh, sexual scandals and have been noticed in the press. So, if there was a newspaper noticing or there was a, a new or something, then, then it was okay. It was an objective category. The second was that uh, uh, we bought that to the national. Institute of Audiovisual in France, again from the Ministry of Culture, and they were very strict regarding which kind of use we were going to do with that material. So uh, we signed a contract that uh, uh, we were not allowed to uh, upload social networks, internet, so that uh, we should preserve its diffusion in our context. This is exhibitions and lectures, as I'm doing. So if anyone is uh, reproducing the video and uploading uh, probably will face some legal problems. And it will be up to you, not, not up to you. And the third and the most important, uh, we were not allowed to use deep fake technology at 100% perfection. We should keep at 80% and allow some imperfection which, we, which uh, would unveil the fact that it was a parody, that it was not a parody. If we were respecting these three conditions, we were allowed to do that. That's, that's the point. But I think that uh, it's, a, it's a good, well, a good moment to, to, start, to finish here. We start with the orgasmic and finish with the orgasmic. So probably we keep on enjoying together. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm here. I can uh, answer your questions or listen to your comments, but maybe not in this cold situation, but uh, instead of having a drink, uh, my, my, you know, my, my answers are much more fluid and I have something to think of. I invite you to, to, to share with me uh, this uh, exhibition and this drink to uh, celebrate the accomplishment of this project. Thank you very much.